Coca-Cola company, minding my business. And he was like, well, if you got such a big mouth, why don't you come and help? <laughs> did I say that? You did? No, actually you said, here's my card, call me Monday. <laughs> that sounds more like me. <laughs> yeah. He was all polished and professional, so I go to work on Monday. I have the card in my purse. I take it out, I put it on my desk, and I think, I'm gonna call him in just a minute. Well, you know how on Mondays you're really busy, right? And by 11 o'clock, I hadn't called him, and this is not a patient man. He called me. And I went, oh, I'm so sorry I meant to call you. And he said, well, let's have a conversation. And we started that conversation. This is a persistent man. He called me every day until I said yes. <laughs> Give him some love. Uh, I, I would say give her some love. She, she gave up a good job <laughs> to come to the WMBA. So thank you. You're doing a fantastic job. job. Thank yeah. you. All right, so Kavita and Krista, um, they were the ones who invited us to do this, so thank you very much. And I, I was thinking when we came up, uh, Kavita and Krista, it sounds like a talk radio show or something, not like Lisa and Adam. It's, there's a lot more uh, sort of music to that. But anyway, I know part of the reason we were here was to talk about memories of being at Duke. I mean, one of the things as we were walking into Page, Lisa said to me, had you ever been to Page when you're in the time? And I think, I know I was here once. I'd never been in the back. It's pretty cool if you want to come back in the stage entrance. But talk a little bit, you know, just share some memories. Sure. So my first memory of Duke is being accepted early admission. And I was really excited about that because I had a really interesting journey in Atlanta. I helped to integrate an independent school. And when I was at that school, lots of folks said, you don't deserve to be here. You're black. And I thought, really? That's how this is rolling? Well, let me just show you whether I belong to be here. That experience sort of set the tenor and tone for who I am, for always trying to exceed expectations. So being accepted at Duke early admission did, in fact, exceed the expectations of my classmates. And so my earliest, fondest memory is being accepted early admission. But then I remember coming here at Page, and I remember being told, we all were, like you all are here, look to your left, look to your right, two of you will not be here in a year. What? That's what they said. I think they were trying to scare us straight into okay. studying or something. Do they do that to you guys? But the next fond memory was being in Cameron, and you guys are really always in Cameron for basketball, right? Give me some, give me some feedback, people. <laughs> Work with me. So what I remember being in Cameron for, though, was a concert. I don't know how many people have heard of Earth, Wind, and Fire. <laughs> So Earth, Wind, and Fire performed my freshman year, and Shaka Khan opened. Y'all remember Shaka Khan? So that was one of my fondest memories. Adam, what about you? Well, you know, we both we both ended up in the basketball business, and I think you know, being here, coincidentally, my first year was 1980, which was the first year that Coach K started at Duke, and I never thought our paths would cross along the way. I have to say that I was a big fan yeah. of Blue Devils when I was here. I just played basketball for fun and I never thought I would end up in this business. And it's interesting, I mean, talk about Duke forever, that then we came together, never having known each other at Duke, but came together as colleagues in the NBA and WNBA. One of the things though, when we were thinking about what to talk about today and, and, a, and a story that's been particularly impactful in a way on both of our lives and a part of Durham history that many of you might not know about, and that's actually a game that took place here in Durham, and it's come to be known as the Secret Game. And there was a documentary on ESPN called Black Magic a few years ago, and then a book by, by the name The Secret Game by Scott Ellsworth, somebody who has a PhD from Duke, that's worth looking up. It was published about two years ago. And I knew a little bit about the history, and, and we should talk about that what, what, as an African-American who attended Duke, what you would heard about it. But it's a game that actually took place at another school in Durham that you don't hear that much about, and that's North Carolina Central University. At the time this game took place in 1944, it was known as North Carolina College for Negroes. That was the name of the school. 
back in 1944. And of course, for you history majors in the room, what was going on in 1944 was World War II. And so you had at the time a, a group of med students, white med students, who had come down to Duke for a fast track medical school program to get to, to get to be trained and then go back out on the front. But that medical school class was comprised of several former All-American college basketball players. But remember, this is before the time of the NBA, but th that wouldn't have been an option anyway because the war was on, so they came here for training. At the same time, at then called North Carolina College, there was a young coach there named John McClendon. And John McClendon had trained at the University of Kansas, where he had attended, under James Naismith, who had the founder of the sport of basketball. And John McClendon, now of course when he was at University of Kansas, this is in the 30s now, he couldn't play basketball there because it was a white only program. But they had black students who were attending the university at the time, he was a phys ed major, right. and trained directly under Dr. Naismith. So he had a team and, and John McClendon to this day is credited with the Four Corners offense that, that Dean Smith used to use at Carolina, but created a much faster paced game of basketball. So these med students who were down here at Duke knew how good those teams were, but again, 1944, there was no integrated basketball being played. And in fact, Durham was a very segregated town, as was North Carolina and virtually the entire South. So they put together this plan to play this game on a Sunday morning in March in 1944. And that game, which took place in the gym at, at NCCU, is only about three or three and a half miles from where we're standing today. And that game is now a part of basketball lore because it was the first collegiate game ever, if you can imagine, where black and white players played on the same basketball floor. And just to give you a little bit of sense of how risky that endeavor was at the time. They, when the med students together with this group, with their coaches, went into the gymnasium, they actually padlocked it from the inside because they were so concerned that people would get in. And they intentionally played on a Sunday morning because the sense was virtually the entire community would, community would be in church and no one would know it was going on. But I mean, it's, they then played, the, the Eagles were the name of the team, from North Carolina College, they actually easily beat this group of all-American med students. And, and well, wait, the med students were the best that Duke had at the time, and many of them had played in college as well, in Montana and Kansas and other places. So we don't think of graduate students today, perhaps as basketball players, but they did have a life before they went to professional school. And, and I remember, Lisa, when I you know, was for telling you I had seen this documentary and read this book, um, you had told me that as a black student here in the late 70s at Duke, that you had known about this game. I'm curious sort of what, what had you heard at the time? So what I had heard about this, when you think about NCCU, most folks do not realize it was founded in 1909, and it was the first public college, liberal arts college for African Americans in the country. The first public one right here in Durham, North Carolina. So in the African American community, we are always interested, as are most communities, in knowing our history. And my political mentor was Maynard Jackson, the first African American mayor in Atlanta, and he attended law school at NCCU. So I knew all about the college, but I knew about the game because sports in general, and certainly our game, is a universal language. And what we all learned was that NCCU had had this groundbreaking opportunity for folks to ha have one another's perspective, to play against one another in what was a technically safe environment because they were in a gym with a padlock door, but it was a dangerous thing to do to have whites and blacks playing basketball or doing anything together, quite frankly. So we were aware, I was aware growing up in Atlanta, the cradle of the civil rights movement, many of the things that had happened around the country where African Americans could go to school, like at Oberlin or NCCU. And, and again, 
Think about this. So this is 1944 at a time when so-called Jim Crow laws were in place in North Carolina, where both by law and sort of by practice, I mean, the African-American players who participated in this game arguably were risking their lives exactly. to, to, to do something that they love, to follow this passion for basketball. And also to set the context too, remember this is three years before Jackie Robinson, the great pioneer African-American in Major League Baseball, played his first game. This is two years before the National Basketball Association was even created. It's 10 years before Brown versus the Board of Education, which is the Supreme Court decision which integrated schools. It's 16 years before Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King led the lunch counter sit-ins in Greensboro. And probably just as importantly, it was 19 years before Duke became an integrated campus. So in my lifetime, Duke was not an integrated school. I mean, just to give you the context and to show you sort of as you're sitting here today in the class of 2017, how far this country has come on terms of principles of inclusion and diversity. So I would say we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. When I look back to the civil rights movement, and Adam told you I finished a little bit before him, I finished in the class of 79, I'll be 60 this year, what do you think? A good six up. But what that means is I've seen a lot, and there's been a lot of incremental progress. But what I would tell you is that when we pass things like civil rights, what we were trying to do is legislate behavior. And what we didn't do is really follow up behind that and have a real action plan on how we bring people together on a regular basis so that they understand one another's perspective and recognize that we are all human beings, two ears, one nose, one mouth, that we all want the same thing. We want our families to be safe. We all want jobs to support our families and our communities. We all want to be safe in our communities. We really have more alike than we have different. What we probably didn't understand is all the history that was created here right in Durham, at Duke, at NCCU, but it really parallels life. It really does. As you sit here today, Adam and I have the blessing of a Duke degree, and you're about to have a blessing of a Duke degree. <laughs> And I will tell you, and I think Adam would attest to this as well, your degree will open doors that you perhaps never even knock on because it says Duke University. We come from a rich heritage and a rich legacy, but with that comes tremendous responsibility and opportunity. So as we look at what has happened in the past and we recognize that I won't call it collective wisdom. I would call it the collective sense of what was right in the old days and that we corrected as a much broader community needs some real attention today. And folks like you who have the benefit of an academic education and the broad experience of being here at Duke with people from all over the country and arguably the world, you have the greatest insight an opportunity and therefore obligation to share those experiences and stand up for what you think is right, just as the medical students did here from Duke and the students from Wynn, North Carolina Central University. No, um, thank you for that, Lisa. And you know, so lastly, I'll just say for me at the NBA and what we do with the WNBA, there's a direct through line from that secret game in 1944 to today, and I think that the, those principles that I inherited as commissioner of the NBA, Lisa as president of WNBA, those principles of diversity, of inclusion, standing up for what's right. If you look back at the history of our league, a few years after that secret game, I mean, and, and a couple of years after Jackie Robinson integrated baseball, we had Sweetwater Clifton, who was the first African American who played in the NBA. And then if you jump to the 1960s, you have the great Bill Russell, who was the first huge African-American star in any sport, certainly in basketball, in the United States. He then became the, the coach of the Celtics, the first African-American coach of any major league team. 
And then you even jump ahead to the 1990s, the early 90s, when I first joined the NBA and Magic Johnson was diagnosed with it being HIV positive and what it meant then when David Stern took a stance and said the science doesn't support those players who say they won't play in a game with somebody who's HIV positive and said those players will be suspended who won't participate. And Magic Johnson clearly changed the world and the view of HIV and AIDS through his participation. And I would say all the way to today, the present, the role that basketball and all, all sports can play in so society. I wrote this down I, when I was reading about this book. Actually, I found there was a quote you know, from Coach K when he was talking about the secret game. And he said, basketball has broken down barriers and helped create a new kind of America. And I think that's very much true. And I would just lastly say that in terms of the ultimate story about Duke truly being forever, it's the way that Lisa and I came together, how fortunate we've been to serve on the board of trustees and, may, and remain involved with this school. So I can only say our experience has been a wonderful one. It's continued to grow. This is really just the beginning as graduates. Obviously, the, the vast majority of your life is ahead of you. I know when I was in the same position you were all in today, I was thinking my Duke experience was ending. It's actually just beginning. And this university opens up such incredible doors to you throughout your life. So I very much encourage you all to take advantage of it. Yeah, I completely agree. When Adam and I met, the first common link we had was Duke. There are many common links. We love the game of basketball. Adam offered me the opportunity to work with him and all of our colleagues in the NBA family. I now had the privilege of leading a league that Adam wrote the business plan for 21 years ago. Somebody say amen, because I got a good job out of this. I, I wrote the business plan, it's still not profitable. But I, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna fix that, I got you. So I will tell you that today, I have the privilege of leading a league of women 21 years in the making. 21, very much, who's 21 in the group? We're about to be, right, right? So y'all are with us, you're with us in the WNBA. We're excited to be a league that is growing. We're one of the youngest leagues that there is. And women still share, unfortunately, the history of being disenfranchised. The WNBA is one of the longest running professional women's sports league ever. We are going to be profitable. You heard it right here, right, right now. season starts this weekend. I would not be doing my job. My boss is right here to hear it. I need you all to watch some WNBA games. You with me? But all jokes aside, we love basketball, but it all started here at Duke. It is very cool that two Dukies get to run professional basketball. Is that not true? It's very cool. And so I know it is a great privilege, but it started here at Duke. Neither Adam nor I are finished, but we invite you to join the legacy, to be engaged, be bold, be Duke. Let's go.